こんにちは。私はディアナです。はじめまして。沖縄に住んでいます。あなたはどこに住んでいますか ?I am obviously practicing my Japanese. でもまだ上手じゃありません。But we'll see how this goes. I really hope you enjoyed that introduction. I、uh, have obviously been playing with the iMovie Pro, whatever, on my phone. I promise there won't be too many of those、uh, long introductions, but there are,、uh, you know, like 10 templates already pre built, so I can bring you all of that lovely, lovely intro music. Unfortunately, there's no Japan、uh, theme, there was India theme, so that's what we're going with this week. Happy New Year's, YouTube. <laughs> This is Hacks to Knits. It's primarily a podcast about knitting. I am coming to you from my home in Okinawa, Japan, and I am so excited that you're all here with me today. If you want to find me on Instagram or Ravelry, you can find me at Hacks to Knits. Happy New Year. Yeah, it is January the 2nd here in Okinawa. We just got done with, of course, all the holiday celebrations. Here in Japan, definitely New Year's Day is more where it's all about for celebrations and events,、uh, as opposed to the US where it's more about the New Year's Eve festivities. Of course, we went out on New Year's Eve, as is our tradition. We hit up one of the local izakayas,、um, and then New Year's Day, we spent time over at the local shrine, which was very much set up like a festival carnival. Atmosphere. There was a lot of good food and a lot of good drinks and、um, games and, and kind of carnival y type events for kids to participate in. I was really shocked at the amount of people that were out and about on New Year's Day.、Um, in our neighborhood, this shrine there was a line of people wrapped around the outside of the block and cars parked. All the way up and down the street for several blocks, and it stayed that way the entire day from early, early in the morning until late, late at night. So, obviously, New Year's Day is a big event here in Japan. Actually, I really, I feel like more than Christmas Day was. New Year's Day was really where all the、uh, events seemed to be happening. Anyway, we had a good time.、Uh, I took a lot of pictures, so hopefully, I'll be putting those pictures right over top of this speech right here and sharing them with all of you. Uh, some other things we did, we went and visited a local cat cafe because why not? We're here in Japan.、Uh, so I will for sure at some point in this episode、um, put in some of those videos at the cat cafe. It was cute. It's not.、Uh, have you been to a cat cafe before? Have any of you been visiting to Japan? There, I really thought they were going to be more of a cafe. I thought I was going to sit down and have a good cup of coffee and that there would just be cats wandering around and. Uh, it's more about the cats, which I guess is what it should be.、Uh, you pay a flat amount per minute to go in, and then you get to play with the cats. You can't pick them up or chase them or wake them up, obviously. And they don't really seem to care that much about you. So, the secret to cat cafes, if they sell cat treats, is to buy them, and then you can lure all the cats to pay attention to you. And of course, as soon as the treats and snacks are done, they don't care about you anymore and disappear. And then, when you're all done, you get a free little vending machine cup of coffee. So,、uh, it was different than I expected it to be, but the cats were beautiful, and I don't know why I'm talking about cats for three minutes at the start of a knitting podcast. Anyway, on to the finished objects for the year. I have two finished objects for you. Let me grab them. 
This first one, I know I have talked about in the last two episodes, is the Victorian raffia pattern. I'll hold this up so you can see it really well. This pattern is for a double knit scarf and I have done this as a stranded colorwork cowl. I talked about how the colors were not going to line up when I joined this back together and so I decided to do just a little bit of decorative braids here. I wish I had practiced these ahead of time. Um, but I did the two braids and then I grafted the two pieces together, which is this purple section. I keep thinking I may want to come and stitch these two braids together so that you can't, let's see, so that you can't see so much of the purple section. But it doesn't bother me. It's decorative. It's cute. I do wish I had practiced them a little bit more before I did them on this project because I've done a few more since binding this one off. There you go. What do you think? This cowl turned out great. Oh, you get to listen to me here. I did knit this as an infinity, infinity cowl. Um, and something else I did was that when I cast on, so because I did this color work in the round, I cast on for two repeats. Um, and I was worried about the jog in the color work where the repeat happens, so I ended up putting in a line of pearl bumps. I don't know if you can see. You can probably see right here. So I did one line of pearl stitches thinking that that would kind of uh, make a fold point where this could lay down flat. So when I blocked it, it would stay flat and hide any potential color work jogs that you might have had. If I were to do this again, I think I would have skipped that part and then instead of um, making a full twist when I grafted the two ends together, so I, I knit a straight line and then I twisted the um, cast on edge and bind off edge together and sewed them together, which is what creates this little folded twist here. Um, I think when I have done patterns like this before, I've done a half twist instead of a full twist, and that wouldn't have worked. Oh man, my hair. Thank you guys. Trying on my cowl immediately messed up my hair. Um, but I think, yeah, if I were to do this again, I would have done a half twist, which would have meant I would have had to kind of squish this tube a different way. I'm not doing a good job of explaining this, but here you go. There, now you can see that line of pearl bumps right down the middle. Either way, I loved knitting this pattern. Um, true to myself, after about one or two repeats, I was ready to be done with it. Um, so I'm glad that I did a cowl instead of a full scarf. And I'll put in a bunch of pictures here of this project. I do have a ton of yarn left over, so I thought maybe I would play around with some of my own stitch patterns and make another uh, colorwork cowl and see how that turns out. So that's something to play with a little bit here in the future. So again, this is the Victoria Raffia cowl and I did it with Cooney Effect Garn. This is the yarn that I used. There you go. And I purchased this yarn and this pattern when I was at Stitches United about two years ago from the booth. Um, yeah. That's what I have to say about that. I have a second finished object for you. I know you're all very excited. Um, gosh, a third finished object is what this should be. The Stripe Tease Socks by General Hog Buffer. I talked to you about these for several episodes here. And those of you who watched my previous episodes will know that I knit two of these and then discovered that my gauge had somehow changed and they were two different size socks. And I didn't really want to knit it a third time. Second sock syndrome hits hard with me. And so instead, I went back to General Hog Buffer's page and found another pattern. So this is the um, vertizontal pattern. I'll hold these side by side so you can see there's a little bit of a difference. So the striped tee sock, you cast on the cuff and work the cuff in the round, and then you work stripes and the whole thing is done in these little stripes. And this is a free pattern, so I'll talk to you a lot about this one too. So for the vertizontal pattern, you again start with the cuff and the round. You again will 
um, basically put all of these front stitches on to hold and then pick up and knit all of these stitches here. So you're going to knit a long flap. You're going to do your uh, heel flap and turn your heel. Your gusset is also worked flat all the way to the toe. You decrease for the toe and then you basically turn over the top of the toe and you're going to pick up stitches all along this flap. Uh, you will put all the stitches that were hold that were on hold back on your needle and then pick up stitches all the way down this flap too. And then you proceed to work in the round. So you're, I'm gonna take this off the blocker here so you can maybe see it a little bit better. So this is the, oh yeah, it does not help at all to put that on the blocker. Hold on. Okay, I have, I have turned this sideways on this blocker so you can hopefully see this is the top of the foot here and you pick up the stitches all the way around this edge and up here and you end up working back and forth flat so you're going to work all the way down you're going to do a decreases for the toe all the way up and then at each edge before you turn you're going to um, decrease one stitch of this cuff so you had all these stitches on the cuff and you work back and forth back and forth this way until you have decreased all of your cuff stitches and then you're going to kitchener stitch all of this straight down the front so you can see that black line there is my kitchener stitch these are the toe decreases and it's really a very interesting pattern um, the designer did put it up as a free pattern and admitted that it wasn't perfect and didn't fit great and uh, it was still a fun experiment to work on um, my only thought on this one is so for the vertizontal sock he has you cast on 80 stitches for so for example if you normally knit about 64 stitches for your sock this one you cast on 80 to get the sock to fit and I think it is because you have to get um, so many rows to cover the top of your foot and you're decreasing one stitch every row that you need these extra cuff stitches but it's obviously a very loose and weird cuff up here so I think if I were to do this again I would cast on the original 64 stitches work my ribbing and then increase up to 80 so that the stitches were available or um, instead of decreasing one stitch every row maybe every other row or something like that but it was a fun use for this yarn. This is a busy, busy yarn. Um, the yarn was, I think if I read this label right, designed to look like this piece of artwork here. So this piece of artwork was the inspiration for this colorway. And this is opal. I bought this at one of the local craft shops here, Pandora House. This is, um, Pandora House is a little craft store in the mall. So it's not a local yarn shop, but it does have some yarn, lots of fabric. It's mostly a fabric store. It's got some leather making and beading supplies and stuff like that. So that is it for my finished objects. I love these socks. I thought I was gonna hate them, but I love them a lot. Um, as far as whips go, I did go ahead and start spinning up some more fiber. This is, oh, hold on. This is Nest Fiber Club April Showers Superwash Merino, the April 2018 colorway. And I took this out of the packaging and fluffed it all up and I could not believe how much fiber they had shoved into this teeny bag. It's not a giant bag I have small hands but it's not a giant hand giant bag um, this is half the fiber shoved back in so I went ahead and stripped it into sections so that I could do a fractal spin and then my plan is to pair this yarn with the yarn that I showed you previously which is the Polworth and silk and uh, I've got some other yarn too, so hopefully I'll make a kind of a three color gradient so that I can use that for um, a pattern of some sort. As you guys can tell, I'm coming to you from a new location in my house today. Uh, try as I might, I could not get the sound or lighting to be reasonable in the room I wanted to podcast in. Uh, this is, I call it the man cave. It doesn't look 
too much I guess it is kind of a man cave we are very much gray and black in this room this is where my computer and my husband's computer live so it's nice to uh, nice to be in a new location <sighs> that's all I have to say about that I hope that I sound better and I look better um, I'll appreciate any feedback on that as far as whips this week, I did continue to work on the Nell sweater, which I know I've been showing you for the past several weeks. It's got one sleeve done, I've started the second sleeve, and I still have to finish up the body. I didn't bring it in today because the eh, it basically looks exactly the same as it did last week. Uh, as far as other whips, I don't have much to show for you here. I have been thinking about doing some sweater design, and I'm getting my book out here. I have been working with Ann Budd's book on top-down sweaters, and I talked about this in the last episode. And so I did a gauge swatch, and I've started writing up um, a sweater pattern using this book just to experiment with it and see how it goes. I don't have much to show you because I actually frogged my swatch, which I don't know why. In hindsight, I, I could have waited until this show was over. But the main color of the sweater is going to be in this which is the Brooklyn Tweed Shelter. It's a worsted weight woolen spun yarn. And the contrast color is the same yarn in the colorway Sap. Gosh, I, I kind of have a predictable colorway. I know that this like green color is not for everyone, but hold on. I mean, it's almost the same, right? Here is my gray and green shawl and my brown and green sweater mm, predictable color patterns anyway <laughs> the problem i had was that um i wanted to use these two colors and do some vertically stranded color work in this and then i got a contrast color this was the yarn i was going to use for my contrast color but once it knit up there was just not enough contrast between them and it looked very um it's like in bright light you'd be able to see the pattern but otherwise you wouldn't and i can't decide whether i like that or not or whether i want to knit something else but the problem is i don't have any more yarn of that weight or spun kind of uh, an appropriate yarn to pair with this project and I'm left trying to decide, do I want to order more yarn and have it shipped here or continue to fiddle around with what's in my stash? My thought is I have some more Brooklyn Tweed, but the Loft colorway, which is, it's, it's basically the same yarn in two different weights, if I have to be honest. Loft is a fingering weight woolen spun yarn. Oop, I don't know if you can see it. And then Shelter is a worsted weight woolen spun yarn. And they're both very similar. They're very light and airy. They're very easy to break, which I always think is interesting. Like you can just snap off a chunk of yarn. But then once it's all knit up, it turns into this lovely fabric that's just really springy and uh, almost a little spongy. Um, so yeah, that's there's nothing to show you for this right now. Just some future planning and playing and daydreaming. The knitting funk has definitely happened here. I finished a couple of projects. I was looking at my queue of things that I wanted to cast on next and they're all just too hot for this climate. I went digging through my sock yarn stash and I didn't even want to make socks because truthfully, it's been too warm for socks. I'm wearing my sandals everywhere every day. So we shall see. Instead of casting on a new project, I decided to fiddle around with some design aspects, um, start to dig into Saturn pattern grading and uh, sweater grading and see if I can come up with something interesting. I think I will um, write up a pattern using this book, the Ann Bud book, and some very simple color work, maybe uh, combine a little bit of vertically stranded color work and horizontally stranded color work. Those vertizontal socks really made me think about it. It's like, I want to see if I can use those two techniques together and then maybe knit a sample. And I'm actually thinking about knitting the sample in the smallest size, just to see how the grading turned out as opposed to knitting it in my size, which is more of a medium to large. 
um, try doing like an extra small or something just to see if it turns out and then I can ask one of my Japanese friends to try it on and model for me. Um, so that's what's going on, works in progress, not a lot to show you, uh, just some, some spinning on the wheel and some, some numbers in the computer really. Um, but it got me thinking about, you know, vertically stranded color work, horizontally stranded color work, intarsia, mosaic stitch, slip stitch, twine knitting. There's a lot of different ways of doing color work. And I don't know how familiar all of you are with them, whether it's something you've used before or haven't used before. And so I just knit up little swatches. These are not gonna be tutorials on how to do these techniques, but I wanted to show them to you and just talk briefly about each of these types of color work. Um, anyway, this is a swatch of stranded color work, uh, AKA Fair Isle. A lot of people will call this Fair Isle. I tend to not use that term because Fair Isle is a definition of um, a region of the world that uses stranded color work, but it also defines the types of stitch patterns that they use, what's traditional for that region, and the way they use those colors together. Um, and there is a difference between stranded color work patterns coming from the Fair Isle region versus like Norway versus the Andes. Um, you know, Andean knitting also has stranded color work and it's vastly different from Fair Isle knitting in the types of colors they use, the type of stitch patterns they use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But Fair Isle color work typically worked in the round. It can be worked flat. I worked this swatch flat just to show it to you. Um, it's worked in the round to avoid having to do uh, the color work on the wrong side where it's more difficult to see what you're doing. It is called stranded color work because you are going to carry both of your strands of yarn across the row, and when you are not using one color, you are floating the other color behind it. So for example, as I'm knitting with this white stit, white yarn, the black yarn is going to float behind it, and as a result, you get all these floats on the back of your work. It's a nice stretchy fabric. The floats can limit your stretch, so you need to be careful to loosely carry them across the back so that you don't lose some of your stretch here. Um, and that's why it's especially important if you're doing like socks to do your gauge swatch because you may find that your gauge is gonna end up different when you do fair isle versus stockinette stitch or non-color work knitting. It's interesting, um, I think I talked a little bit before about how I did my report for the Master Knitter program. You have to do a report on two different techniques uh, traditional knitting techniques, and I did mine on Fair Isle and Andean stranded color work. And in stranded color work, Fair Isle color work, you only carry two stitches across the row ever. And in the Andean regions, they will do more than that, and they will end up twisting the stitches together. So if they have three or four colors carrying across, they'll twist those strands together to make a dense fabric. And that reminds me a lot of twined knitting. So twine knitting, uh, this is a sample that I knit up. I took a class at Stitches United and these are the little sample mittens that they have you knit for that class. What's funny is these are not all that small. I mean, yes, the thumb hole's teeny, but I have small hands. I can almost, I mean, my, my palm's right here. I can almost fit my whole whole hand in this sample, but um, this is, I mean, technically you could call this a stranded color work. You do carry both of your strands across the row, but you twist those strands together when you knit, which is also what they do in Indian knitting. Um, so just, you know, be careful when you call something Fair Isle. Is it Fair Isle um, or is it stranded color work? because Fair Isle uh, implies more than just the fact that you're using two colors of yarn that are stranded across the back. Uh, yeah, that's all I want to say about this type of knitting. Next thing is intarsia. I think I've been pretty adamant about telling you how much I hate intarsia. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hate it. I, I like the stitch patterns you can make from it. I hate the yarn management of it, and I'll tell you about this in just a second. So intarsia, unlike Fair Isle knitting, is almost always knit flat. 
And the reason that it is almost always knit flat is because if you were knitting in the round, um, you would end up, well, let me explain how this is knit first. So unlike stranded knitting, you do not carry your yarns across the row. For intarsia, this is a really sad swatch, but you will have one bobbin of yarn for this white section. Here it is. One bobbin of yarn for your black section and another bobbin of yarn for the next white section. And the reason for that is that you do not carry the yarns across the back like you do in stranded knitting. If I turn this around, you can see that there's no floats of white yarn across the back. Instead, they are um, twisted together at the join here. So what you would do is you would knit your white stitches. When you reach the black section, you would pick up the black yarn, twist the yarns together to interlock them, drop your white yarn and then continue across the row with your black yarn until you reach the next section where again you would pick up twist the yarns together drop your black one and then continue with the white section and the reason that this has to be done flat is because if you were working in the round when you got back around to the next section you wouldn't have your ball of yarn to use because it'd be still floating at the other side so that's why Intarja is typically done flat. However, again, in the Andes region, there are areas where they do intarsia in the round. And the way they do that is that when they come back around and reach the section where they want to knit again, uh, let's just pretend that this is a white section. They will take the yarn, estimate how much yarn they're going to need, and then um, put it, you know, pick it up there and knit with this float. And if they didn't estimate right, then they come back with their needle and they start fudging the stitches, moving the fabric, moving the yarn left and right until they have the right amount of yarn left, which is uh, sounds incredibly fiddly and difficult, but it is a technique that's used in the world where they use intarsia in the round. So worth knowing. And then the last thing which I've talked a lot about is this vertically stranded color work. Now I've only encountered this term vertically stranded color work when I um, took a class with Laura Lee Beltman at, again, at Stitches United. And so I don't know if she made up that term or not. It does remind me a lot of intarsia. Um, I think if I encountered this in the wild, I probably would have called it an intarsia technique, but it does differ a little bit. And the main reason being that your main color, you are gonna carry back and forth across all rows. There won't be any point where you will be dropping this color. Um, it's gonna stay uh, in your hand the whole time. And instead, all of these contrast colors, um, whereas in intarsia, you have to wind each one of these into their own bobbin because you're using each color in different amounts. With this one, you're only gonna knit one stitch of each contrast color strand each row. And so as a result, you can take all of the contrast colors and wind them into one center pole ball or butterfly. And thus, you don't have to do any twisting at all. You don't have to um, untangle all the time because basically you're never getting tangled. Everything is all contained in one single butterfly. Um, and there's no twisting or interlocking at all because you're always carrying your white yarn. You just pick up your, st your black yarn, knit the stitch, drop it, continue on your way, pick up, knit, drop it. You don't have to do any twisting. So I like this technique a lot. I like it a lot more than I like intarsia. Um, but it got me thinking, so that vertizontal sock I was uh, using definitely made me think about using vertically stranded color work and horizontally stranded color work together. In this case, horizontally stranded color work, I mean just stranded color work, what most people call it. I was just sort of taken to saying horizontally stranded now that I'm using vertically stranded. I have to differentiate the two somehow. Another thing about this technique that you have to be careful of are um, twisted stitches. I don't know if I can see any in here, but when you are traveling in a straight line up and down like this, every other row you're going to end up with a twisted stitch. So what you have to do is every other row knit these stitches through the back loop so that they don't get twisted. And that occurs when you're traveling also, I think, to the right 
for most traditional knitters. Um, it will occur when you're traveling that way too, not when you're traveling to the left, oddly enough. So what I recommend is if you are knitting in this technique to every time you encounter one of these uh, contrast color sections, to just take a moment to look at it and determine whether that stitch is going to end up twisted when you knit it, and if it is, then to knit it through the back loop instead. So definitely want to experiment a little bit with using these two techniques together. Kind of exciting. That's what's on my brain, what I'm working on this week. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about my home brewing, and it is a tale of woe. Oh, I don't even want to tell the story, but I'm going to. So a couple of weeks ago, a couple of episodes ago, I told, I showed you some videos of my brew day. Brew day went spectacular, by the way. Everything went great. I know I mentioned that I purchased the Anvil Foundry Brewing System, and that was my first time using it, and everything went so smoothly, so nicely. So I do want to start out this story by saying that it has nothing to do with the equipment that I bought. Um, so... I'm so sad. Okay. Um, brew day went great. Brew day went wonderfully. Uh, some issues that I'm having here in Alaska are, here in Alaska, some issues that I'm having here in Okinawa versus when I was in Alaska are um, power. So basically the power in this house. I In Alaska, I would mostly, mostly brew in the winter time. And I did that because the fermentation temperature in my house in the winter was basically the perfect temperature for fermenting. And so I didn't really have to do any temperature control. I could just set my carboy uh, with its airlock in my basement and let it go. It would be fine. When I got here, I knew that temperature was going to be a problem because it's just so warm here that I was going to need some sort of temperature control. Um, so what I did was I bought this Inkbird uh, device, and I'll put a picture up here, but it's basically uh, a device with a thermometer that you can tape to your carboy, and it's got two power outlets, one for heating and one for cooling. So you set your temp set your temperature and it will kick on the heating or the cooling element based on how hot or cold your beer is getting. In this case, the cooling element was plugged into my mini fridge or my kegerator and the heating element was a um, little heating wrap that wraps around the carboy. I suspect that never in this process the heating element was going to kick on at all because that's just the way it is here that I'm just mainly going to need cooling. But that was cool, new setup. I did my first brew day, it was um, back in August and it went great. I ended up doing an extract, uh, seven hop IPA kit using extract. And that went fine, went great, no problems. Everything was good, the beer was delicious. Um, and then this brew day, I um, was doing an all grain, so not, no extract, all grain uh, Belgian blonde. And it went great. I was very nervous that the yeast wasn't going to turn out well because I was shipping the yeast from the US. So I bought liquid yeast and dry yeast. Um, and the reason I bought both was because in case the liquid yeast was dead on arrival, I had the dry yeast as a backup plan. But I made a yeast starter two days ahead of time and the, the yeast did great. Um, I was using, oh gosh, I don't have the numbers with me, but it was a Y yeast, the um, Belgian Ardennes is the, the name of the yeast, and I'll put the numbers in below for you. So anyway, everything went great. Um, I was trying out a new airlock, so when you have a glass carboy, so the carboy is your um, container that you're keeping your beer in as it is fermenting, you typically put a plastic bung in the top with an airlock and that airlock will allow CO2 to escape but air shouldn't be able to get back in. You fill it with a clear solution of alcohol or sanitizing solution. 
Um, and I traditionally have an issue with those airlocks basically shooting off the carboy and like leaving an arc of beer across my fridge or my kitchen or wherever I happen to be fermenting. And so I was trying something new. I got some of these carboy caps to go on where you can uh, attach a blow off tube and then run that tube down to like a big jug of um, sanitizing solution with the thought that hopefully it won't blow across your room. And when I did a dry run test of these, they worked great. And I was able to, you know, get them to really seat well onto that glass carboy. But when it came brew day, everything was wet. You know, you're using star sand, you're using, you know, liquid, lots of water. Um, and I just couldn't get the cap on very well. And so I thought, you know, I got it on there okay. And then I took tape and I taped it down. And I'll put a picture here of my taped in carboy. Um, and I thought that looked good. It was not. Um, a few days later, I, you know, went to check on it and it had blown the, the top off of the carboy and spilled some wort all over the fridge. And so I did a really quick cleanup. I thought I would just, you know, wipe down the worst of it. And then once all the fermenting is done, I could pull it out of the fridge and, um, you know, do a deep clean, get everything out of the fridge because there were little bits of wort all over the fridge. And that day, as I was cleaning it up, it was a gorgeous day. It was cool. I had the windows open. It was breezy. Um, I had the slider door open because my cat was coming in and out off the porch and thought nothing of it at all. Uh, did my quick cleanup, shut everything up and went on with my life. Um, and yeah, just kind of forgot about it until about a week later when I came home and there was this smell in my house. It was gross. I didn't know what it was. I went crazy uh, cleaning around the kitchen, taking the trash out, checking the sinks, and finally discovered that the smell was coming out of my kegerator. And opened it and immediately shut it. Um, it was bad, I'm gonna spare you guys the details, but basically on that bright, sunny, beautiful day when I had all my windows open and I was cleaning out my beer fridge, a fly must have flown in and then laid eggs. And it was really, really gross. <laughs> um, I'm not going to tell you all the details because it was real bad. But the, the short um, version of this story, long story made short, is that I had to throw away all of that beer. It went all down the drain. My fridge had to go outside where I was power cleaning it and scrubbing it for hours. Um, and I've really kind of got the heebie-jeebies and I'm afraid to even do another brew day. I... I mean, there were little fly eggs everywhere, everywhere, like all up in the tower and everything. And so now I, um, I know that I can clean all of that out, but the, the germaphobe in me wants to just buy all new equipment. Obviously, I'm not going to buy an all new mini fridge. I was able to take all of that out and clean it all out and wash everything out real well. But um, some of the parts to the tap tower and mm -mm, nope, nope, I think I'm buying new stuff. Yeah. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see how long it takes me to get my nerve up to do another brew day. But that is um, the tale of woe. It, it is such a shame, too, because that beer smelled really good as I was pouring out the whole thing. Um, it had to be poured out. We'll, we'll just make that clear now. There was no saving it. So that is what happened with my beer, in case you're wondering. Um, so life stuff up and coming. I have started watching some Japanese knitting podcasts. It took me a really long time to figure out how to find Japanese knitting podcasts. Um, the main reason being that I didn't speak enough Japanese. So I'm, I'm actually working on learning Japanese. I'm using a course called Pimsler, which I like a lot. No sponsorship, obviously, but I've been using it for about three weeks now and I'm pretty impressed, like almost immediately. Um, I've been able to use my lessons out and about and in town and so that's exciting. In fact, one of the, um, one of the locals that live near me at the izakaya that I like to visit has commented on my Japanese, so it made me very excited. Um, but yes, yeah, so that long ramble is to tell you that 
the Japanese podcasts were hard for me to find because I was trying to Google the word knitting and um, I was getting amimono, which I think can mean both knitting and crochet. I think it means like some sort of fiber craft. I may be wrong here, but I would um, was not getting podcasts. I wasn't getting things that I wanted to do until I finally found um, the word keto. Keto? Keto. is the Japanese word for yarn. And so once I started searching for that, then I was able to pop up some of these knitting podcasts. I've been watching um, Maro's Knitting Room and um, Amimono Sheep and Amimono Sheep, a uh, couple of knitting podcasts. And I get some of it. I get a word here or there and I'm learning my colors and I'm learning, you know, some of the words for yarn. And so it's been nice to watch those and I'll put some links below into those. And maybe if you know of some Japanese language podcasts that you'd like to share with me, comment below. I'd love to see them. Uh, all of this came up, the, the word keito, keito, K-E-I-T-O. Obviously, if you were spelling it in English letters or romanji, um, came up because I am planning a trip to Tokyo. My husband and I are going to try to visit Tokyo in March and uh, Tokyo has some great yarn shops. So I'm very excited about that because there aren't any really local yarn shops here. And one of them is called Keito, which is the word for yarn. Um, and so, yeah, just planning my, my trip and my life. So hopefully I'll be able to share some of that with you in a few months. Um, I am actually running out of time today. The light is changing, it's daylight hours. I think you can tell, hopefully, maybe. Um, but I've got places to be today. So the sun has come up and I've got some errands to run, which means it's time for me to leave the house and get those done before I have to uh, go to bed and prepare for my night shift tonight. So thank you so much for joining me today. I'm gonna have to do a lot of editing because I think I did some rambling on, um, I hope you like the new setup here. Uh, hopefully not too distracting with the cat running around and life happening behind me. But thank you so much for joining me. My name is Deanna. This is the Haxton's Knit, knit ha, blah, blah, blah. This is the Haxton Knits podcast. Have a good day.